Hello, my name is Mordred Viking and I'd like to welcome you to this Community Cup Final where we are watching two absolutely fantastic teams facing off against each other. We've got Kaiserreich Weekly in the Allies and then we have got Worlds Ablaze in the Axis. But today I do have a co-commentator, Big Schmokes. Hello. Hello and good evening everybody. I am... Um this is just such an exciting moment. This is going to be an epic showdown. Mordor, how do you feel about this? I am really, really excited. So I've I've had the joy of watching Worlds of Blaze in the preliminaries and also in the semi-final. So I am fully aware of what they are capable of. But I've also seen Kaiserreich Weekly in their own tournament playing. So I know what they're aware of too. And I'm aware of what they're good at too. I mean, Kaiserreich certainly has given me a few very interesting games to cast. And before we continue, I just want to introduce the players from the uh, Kaiserreich side. They're going to be playing the Allies today. And on that note, we've got, and I'm just going to pull up the player map mode so you guys can see exactly what I'm seeing. On the UK, we've got uh, Jedi Reven as the main with uh, Purple as his co-op. We've got Mr. Swamp on the US with Mega Luxray as his co-op. For France, we've got Mr. Captain Allen. Canada's got Malevolent playing it. Australia is going to be played by Vestum. We've got Derp on South Africa. And my personal favorite, and you guys, the people that saw the semis will know this, we've got the legend himself, Zobertus, playing New Zealand. And that is going to prove to be something we want to we want to keep an eye on as the game progresses. Furthermore, we've got Stoop on the Raj. We've got Empress of France on Mexico. The USSR is played by Big Lassie with co-ops, Freddy and Tedok. And now, who do we have on the uh, the Axis for today? Well, heading up the Axis in Germany, we've got Shadow. And I'll go through the co-ops in a minute, because that's going to require me to open another window. We've got Argos in Italy. We've got Elite Sniper in Romania. We've got Ian in Hungary. Then there is Mad Brad in Bulgaria. Over in the east, we have got Uncharted in Japan. Toxic Biscuit in Manchuria. We have got Warbrain in Siam. And of course, and I'm not going to forget him, because I've forgotten him before... DJF in Iraq, which is always kind of my wild card. I love the fact that Iraq is a player in this. It really Iraq changes has things. It's brought us so many good memes to this tournament. Huzzah. Like, just seeing the camels... I mean, in two games, we saw the camels conquer Moscow, which certainly was a surprising sight for any player that's ever played vanilla. But the camels haven't been just Iraq's play. They've also come in really handy for, for other players and just generally speaking, seeing camels has been an absolute blessing. It's been hilarious. Absolutely. And I, from the strategic side, I just really like it because it put that extra pressure on Egypt and Suez and it means that the Axis really have a reason to fight in Africa. Otherwise, I find too often they just skip across the Mediterranean and ignore it. Exactly. Now, normally in traditional vanilla games, often you find that the rule set restricts France to only taking the option that pushes them into uh, taking Vichy France. Uh, this rule set is a little different for those of you that uh, haven't seen any of the matches because France is actually limited to or rather restricted to only taking the path that does not allow Vichy to spawn, which means that Italy has two borders to defend in Africa. But with the addition of Iraq, there's actually some more more strategy to it because they've also got to defend from Iraq. So it's not just Italy that faces foes in two ends, but it's also the UK, Huzzah. which has provided some interesting sights over the past week. Players have really been struggling with trying to figure out how to defend the Suez or, and on the Italian end, to actually take over the, uh, the North African uh, clay. And in both of the games I've seen so far, the Axis ended up winning Africa. And I think that in both cases, in large part, was because of the additional pressure exerted from Iraq. Then the other thing I want to bring up about Iraq also being a player is the fact that there's another source of oil. Uh, in the second game, especially, that took a large role in relieving some of the pressure on Romania. Although, hilariously, in the first game, he completely forgot to do any of the oil tech researches. So he <laughs> <laughs> didn't make any use of that whatsoever. Oh no, the Axis must have been uh, relatively annoyed with that. <laughs> I suspect so, yeah. So I've said my piece about Iraq. Are there any nations and players that you're particularly excited about? I mean, as I pointed out at the start, New Zealand is definitely going to get up to some wild things. It's actually funny you pointed out that the Axis won the Africa War in the games that you casted, because the first game I casted, which was Kaiserreich versus Paradox Interactive Roleplay, I was shocked by the sight of 10 with light tanks, that's five light tanks in a single division, being brought out under the flag of New Zealand and completely obliterating the Italian defense in North Africa, actually winning them 
almost single-handedly North Africa. Obviously, he had some support, but just watching them boom and zoom through Libya and take out the Italians was an absolute blessing. And I really encourage anybody who hasn't seen it to check the clip out on Reddit. It was so funny. It's a great clip. I, I definitely would urge you to watch it. But it's interesting you bring up Italy because my MVP in the first game were the Italians. The Italians have definitely been a player to watch, if not the player to watch. They're just everywhere. It's, it's really hard to pin down exactly where the Italians are. And playing in the supporting role to a very, very solid Germany, I'm really looking forward to seeing some more Italian shenanigans this time around. Yeah, so do I. I mean, I, I actually have had the pleasure of playing with both the Germany main and the Italy main before. They're people that I've played Hoi 4 with for approximately a year and a half now. And Chado, the guy who uh, mains, uh, or at least he's one of the German players, he is an absolute monster when it comes to defeat in detail. Like, give him a few heavy tanks, uh, tell him to right-click the enemy, and you will see them disappear. I mean, he took down an absolute absolute monster on um, the USSR. Obviously, most of you guys will probably know Grisha. Grisha Putin, who's a big Hoyt 4 streamer as well. Absolute king at micro. And he got taken down by my own shadow, which was amazing to see. And then Argos with the wild card. I mean, I think most people remember that from one of your first games. The fact that he naval invaded like Siberia and just walked all the way down to Moscow. It's just one of the funniest things I've seen. And seeing the other players react to it was even funnier. So he's, he's, so, he's done it in both games, attacking through Archangel <laughs> and then pushing south while Germany pushes in from the west. It's, it's just been a pleasure. Exactly. And seeing that, you know, and th that's one thing that I actually wanted to point out. Both of these teams have shown consistently throughout the tournament, and now there has been a lot of growth as they went, that they are capable of playing as a team. Now, there were two teams, uh, I think it was Bruder Krieg and Road to 56 RP that both brought in a gigantic like monster name of a player and they invested heavily into getting that player set up and these teams both decided to go the other route and instead play traditionally and so far it's actually well benefited them both because here they are in, in the finals and I'm excited to see what they're going to try. I mean, like you said, we have Argos with his crazy strategies. We've got our Zubertas down in New Zealand, and I think it's going to be a battle of the titans between those guys. Absolutely, and I think that the dimension of teamwork there is absolutely key. My favorite example was during the Operation Sea Lion in the first game that World's Blaze were in were because uh, Germany managed to land a bunch of tanks, but they were in serious danger of being surrounded. And then just moments later, boom, Italian infantry arrived, shored up the front line, and that basically just freed up those German tanks to push further into Britain and eventually capitulate them in 1940. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I, I remember watching that back and just seeing how distraught the other side was when they found their UK had fallen. And it's things like that that I'm looking forward to because these players have proven time and again that they are more than willing to think outside of the box and commit. That That's the best part about it. They're not just in, you know, now like one foot in, one foot out. They fully commit to these crazy strategies. And it's just shown time and again in this tournament that a lot of players who play the game traditionally struggle against it. They don't know what to do. Yeah, exactly. And I just reminded myself that I haven't actually finished introducing everyone. I didn't do the co-ops. So Shadow's co-op in Germany is We Too Low. Argos's co-op in Italy is Mark. And Japan's co-op in Japan is Uncharted. No, sorry, Uncharted's the main. We've got Eigel is the co-op. So um, I just got booted from the server. <laughs> oh, I'm still <laughs> in. Did you no, I'm still in, but we are paused. Okay, I'm going to have to uh, rejoin that. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. You mean that I was not kicked for once? No, I actually got kicked. This I'm this really is amazing. Bad. Usually it's me. <laughs> <laughs> like every single time something goes wrong, it's always me that gets kicked. Uh, server lost, so I'm assuming we're rehosting. Yeah, probably. Let me just grab that, and I believe I'm about to get a DM. Um... Oh, the host apparently pressed the wrong starting option and apparently enabled civilian mode, which gives it a plus 50% bonus to everything, so we're going to have to rehost. <laughs> ah. I mean, that could have been interesting to see, but okay. <laughs> we're unfortunately not placing or playing the uh, boosted bonobo version of the game tonight, uh, viewers. I'm very sorry. And while we're talking about viewers, um, I will mention that I am streaming this on two channels at the moment. I'm currently live on my own Mordred Viking channel, and then I have a helicopter going overhead. Shush, I'm talking. Um, then we also have the stream going out on Paradox Interactive, which is just a restream of what I'm streaming here. So if you see follow alerts and things like that, um, I think I might actually turn those off for this because I'm live on Paradox. 
So I do apologise if you come in with that type of thing. I very much appreciate you, but got to be professional. <laughs> <laughs> and in the meantime, my game is actually fully crashed. So please, one moment, we're we're getting right back into it. They're just re-hosting anyway, so it's going to take a minute regardless. I'm going to go and clean <clears> my <throat> cache and everything. Good practice. <laughs> So how are you all so, doing today, chat? Hope you are having a fantastic Saturday so far. Are you excited? Are there any players you particularly want to see um, do their thing? Are there any players you you think are going to be the MVPs? I'm curious. Oh, and as a quick reminder to those of you in my chat, and I don't know if you have the same command, Mordred, but uh, we are currently running a few giveaways, and at the moment we're giving away some Stellaris Nemesis DLC keys. If you're in my chat, you can follow use the command exclamation mark raffle to join and uh, in a few hours we'll give away some uh, some keys and that is a very good reminder because i need to go and set up my co-commentator command so i can send people over to your channel for those giveaways <laughs> co -host, that was it yeah, come on, guys, seeing it's a great start. I mean, we've all played Hoi 4 before. I, at least I hope most of you have. If you ever played Hoi 4 uh, multiplayer? Lobby Simulator is a wonderful part of the game. It's it's where, you know, it's not about the fact that we spend time in Lobby Simulator. It's about the friends we make along the way, all the memes we share and the good times we have there. And I'm fairly certain like 50% of my hours are probably in the lobby. So I uh, got some experience <laughs> there. I mean, and at the very least, we didn't get into a year of the game and then have to rehost. So it could be worse. It could be worse. Yeah, it was only the beginning of February, maybe not even the end of January. I think it was like January 26th or something. So really not yeah, too big a deal. something like that. <laughs> yes, the host indeed may have done something like that. All right, there we go. I, I'm back in now. I think most of the people are back in the server as well. Uh, good question there. How long is this stream going to be? Uh, until it ends, <laughs> would be the simple answer. I think the uh, approximate time will be anywhere between six to eight hours. Most games have lasted six hours, but, you know, we do have to account for delays. And, well, like you just witnessed, they can happen pretty easily. And uh, so, yeah, it might, might take a little longer, but usually the game will last around six to seven hours, something like that. Yeah, exactly. I think my first game was the full eight hours. It went on quite a long time. The second one was a pretty short six. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly certain we um, we just play, played um, what you call Estafet with that. Like I, I had the five hour game on Saturday and I think you had the eight hour one. And then on Sunday, I got the eight hour one. I think you were like six hours into it. So sometimes you, you draw the uh, short end of the stick, I believe it is. Is that what yes. it is? Yes, it is. Exactly. Uh, sorry, and just... sometimes you get lucky. Putting in the host details. Excuse me, putting off the break screen while I do that because secret things are happening. More secrets. Exactly. And hey, if the game lasts any longer, you know, that means there's more Hoi 4 for us to enjoy. So why not? An extra hour here or there won't hurt. Is the stream on the uh, two minute delay? Yes, it is. It is, in fact, for both of us. So um, if the interaction is a tiny bit slow uh it is for competitive integrity it's all for a good cause we of course want to make sure that uh, nobody gets an unfair advantage not saying that anybody would but it's all precautions to ensure that the game runs as fairly as possible for both sides and yeah sometimes we're just gonna be a little slower to reply but uh, that shouldn't deter you from uh asking questions or commenting on stuff <laughs> oh i love kaiserreich players why does germany not have black monday in this <laughs> <laughs> it's been amazing the amount of LARP going on throughout this tournament. The first game was by far the worst for me because I act the actual Paradox roleplay server in that. And the second they realized they weren't going to win the game, they full on committed to the roleplay. And it was just hilarious. Like people making up missives and just committing to it was just hilarious to witness. And they were all good sports about it too. I mean, at the end of the day, it is a competitive game. And at the end there are winners and there are losers and a lot of people have shown that this community is a lot of people that uh, aren't afraid to take an l sometimes and just move on and just overall the interaction between the communities has been amazing to to witness they've all been for the most part super kind to each other and it's just been a good showing for uh, for our game absolutely and this is a competitive game there are prizes on the line at the end of this and schmokes and i are also both being sponsored by paradox at the moment for doing this commentary so, 
We're getting a lot of support, which is awesome. And that actually reminds me, I need to update my title to say sponsored. Oh yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a very good point indeed. <laughs> there we go. You see, don't worry. The gate, the host makes a mistake. You know, we're we're prone to making mistakes too. We're human after all. But now that we're back in, there's actually something that I am gonna be taking a look at here. One piece of criticism that I had for a lot of players when we started out this journey last week was that a lot of them. We're making some big fundamental mistakes, as in fundamentals of the game. There are some things that, you know, some mods they remove or adjust, and a lot of these players come from communities that play a lot of mods, right? So one big thing was that people seem to have the idea or understanding that one division training does not work. Uh, one division training, for those of you who don't know, means that you have one division, and by using that one division, you optimize the amount of army XP you gain as the game progresses. Now. The way it works was changed a while back, so the bigger your starting army is, the longer it takes for XP to come in uh, when you've uh, essentially like removed all the other divisions and just kept one. But the smaller your army is, the sooner the, the curve kicks in. Essentially, I think it's a calculation within the game that um, downsizes your original army size to decide how much experience you get per battalion in the field. And to optimize this, use one division training. So you have one division and you grab the division, Bye. usually it's your starting infantry division, whichever template is the biggest, and you keep adding uh, an infantry battalion until you have a 50 width division, which is every single slot used. And that way you get 0.25 XP uh, a day for absolutely no cost, or at least you're, you're not burning through infantry equipment and support equipment and et cetera while you're training your divisions. And to my surprise, a lot of players at the start of this journey did not do that. And I had to criticize a lot of them. I called them out on stream. I even had the opportunity to do a, uh, a little game against the uh, Kaiser Weekly team yesterday where I had a little look-see, made sure that they um, changed their ways. And I'm actually happy to report that I'm currently clicking through all the players that are not going to have to send volunteers. And I'm just happy because all I see is one division training going on. And it's I'm so glad that they have been paying attention and upping their game as the um, tournament has progressed. Yeah, and I'm just looking through all the Axis players as you're saying that, and none of them are doing this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, I actually, it's like, see, I'm, well, I'm usually the type of person, I, I hate exploits, and that to me sounds like an exploit, and that's the kind of thing I would discourage. So it's kind of interesting that we have such a different opinion on that. Well, I mean, it could be, I suppose it could be considered an exploit if you oh, really want to stretch is. it. I mean, Disbanding it, your entire army to train just one army, that's an exploit. Whether it is or it isn't is not really up to me to decide, but for the tournament, I know that nobody has been criticized and or addressed for doing it, and I believe that everybody's on the same page, that it's fine, I, nobody has complained about it, so the, for the most part, from what I understood from the players themselves, they thought it didn't work anymore, and that's why they haven't been doing it. But it is still the most efficient way in the game to gather XP, and most players are doing that now. I mean, at the end of the day, if, if you look at it from an historical perspective, it doesn't make sense, but you know, games, especially competitive ones in history, don't often align themselves. Yeah, that's true. And while I was clicking around, I realized there was another Axis player that I haven't actually introduced. I'm so sorry, Finland. Uh, we've got King of Scots in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> Poor man. Uh, before it was Iraq, now it's Finland. I think I've got everyone else. I'm pretty sure uh, I have. You listed the co-op, so I think you're good now. Also, I do have to apologize to everybody that's played Bulgaria so far in the tournament. Yesterday, I actually had the opportunity to play Bulgaria against the guys from uh, Kaiser Weekly. And I have been calling out the Bulgaria player for not one division training, but I completely forgot the fact that Bulgaria starts with army restrictions and I had to find that out the hard way the other day. So what that means is Bulgaria from the start of the game is not allowed to change its units, disband units, or edit the, uh, the templates, which means that they simply can't touch it until they click a little decision called uh, refuse army restrictions or go through it the diplomatic way and by doing uh, the focus that you can find over where is it uh, here negotiate bulgarian rearmament so sorry bulgaria players i apologize but they in fact cannot delete anything yeah and actually uh, bulgaria is a really interesting one because i quite like the new focuses from battle of the bosphorus but bulgaria multiplayer is difficult like i watched uh, alex the rambler really struggling in uh, playing bulgaria when i was playing as greece and it, it, it's it's not great if you're not used to getting around all the different focuses and what the uh, the restrictions they they impose on you. There definitely is... I mean, it, it, it takes some getting used to. I have to admit that when I first got Battle for the Bosporus, it 
definitely took me a moment to read through the whole focus tree because there's a lot going on. But essentially, once you understand the the very base like political mechanics, it is not that tough to get through. It just takes a while. You actually have to you know be patient, read through everything, make sure you understand it. You know, Reddit guys are very useful in that regard. And you know, just at the start, you just have to negotiate the whole like the the, the factions you have to integrate or uh, that you have to crush like the communists if you're playing a fascist Bulgaria. Uh, but it actually is a miner that has a lot of different paths it can go. Like, two of the most meta approaches that I've seen are uh, D-Day Bulgaria, where you essentially spam uh, units such as bricks or uh, 20 with shovels, or uh, in this case where the tournament allows it, 10 with shovels, which is 5 infantry battalions with engineers, uh, while you're playing mass assault, and that just turns into you having you know 400 to 500 divisions that can just infinitely cycle in and out of attacks or unlike i did myself yesterday light tank bulgaria is also a lot of fun to play uh, light tank bulgaria essentially just has you join in operation barbarossa and uh, harass the enemy's infantry and i literally had a, so much fun with that last night just running around the russian tanks ignoring them while germany takes care of them and just encircling infantry division you know one after another and just deleting them it, it is an absolute blast to play if you know what you're doing yeah, and I often see that Bulgaria does have some really interesting templates and they, they, they bring different tactics to the game. So once you get past those restrictions, Bulgaria can really start to put in some real power. It's just the early game for them. It's, it's, it's difficult. It's hard. Yeah, it is, like, without a doubt. Just there's so many moving parts to it. It's almost like, I, I like to refer to it as like a mini US because the US obviously was one of the first nations that had like the massive um, political mechanics introduced with Congress and Senate and whatnot, where you have to manage the amount of senators you have. You lose some or you gain some with focuses and decisions. And Bulgaria is very similar to that. It just it manages it in a different way. With the US, it's a constant struggle. And like you said, with Bulgaria, it really only is an early game issue. Once you get through that and once you're set up, you can, you can actually get a decent economy out of it. Like, you know, you, you have all these lovely provinces in uh, Yugoslavia you can grab. There's some in Greece. And obviously in the tournament, uh, there are some restrictions, but you can really go ham and core a lot of stuff with this and really boost your economy and do some amazing things with it. Yeah, and with the uh, the different factions that you can support in Bulgaria, you can also get some very good generals and some very nice bonuses, which last the entire game. Um, you can really empower yourself depending on which paths you take. All in all, Bulgaria, for my, especially for a minor nation, obviously the minor nations usually are a little more um, gated towards doing one very specific thing. It mostly has to do with less research slots and less economy, so they really have to pick and choose like, hey, this is my game plan, this is what I'm going to do. Bulgaria actually has a lot of options, uh, especially with you know their Battle for the Bosporus focus tree and everything that comes with it. You know, it's not like it's not quite like playing a major nation like you know Germany or Italy or the UK or whatever, but it still has a lot of interesting paths you can take. Just like, uh, you know, for example, on the Allied side, you've got Australia, which also has so many different things it can do and actually, which actually work within the meta. Because you do find that a lot of nations, especially within like the established multiplayer meta, don't really have, you know, a lot of different things they can do. You know, if you think about South Africa, for example, where you really only ever see heavy tanks. Yeah, exactly. And South Africa is like such an established meta. It's like, you're South Africa, you do tanks. And that's all you do. Um, it never leaves any variety, and if you screw up with the tank production, um, you're pretty screwed. Yep. One thing that's actually interesting to to like, take a look at. So, not a lot. I've I've not played in a lot of servers that uh, restrict tech stealing, but for the whole tournament, tech stealing has been disabled. Now, tech stealing is using the spy mechanic in order to steal technology, uh, as it, you know, as is in the name, uh, from different nations. So. What you'd usually do, like some some, you know, meta strategies are, you get your Australia um, to rush the fighter ones, which this Australia is not, or fighter two, sorry, which this Australia is not doing, which is interesting. Usually, you, even within the current rule set, you would have Australia rush fighter twos. But you, you'd have Australia rush fighter twos, and then have somebody steal it from them, and then a third party who is in the same faction as Australia would steal it from them. That's not going on. And so what we see is a lot of different variations to, you know, establish meta. Like, for example, this is something I don't see often. France is researching fighter ones at the start of the game, and I assume the UK will be as well. Something which I'm Are noticing they? now, France already has spies, and they're currently in Austria. Why would they be doing that? Well, um, they've got a mission, which is uh, called in Infiltrate Civilian Administration, uh, or Infiltrate the Army, or Infiltrate the Air Force. And by doing these missions on repeat, you can actually get several things. Now, infiltrating the civilian administration will yield you political power. I think it's at 25. And infiltrate the army and air force and, and so on and so forth will give XP corresponding to whatever department it is you infiltrate. 
Gotcha. Because I was looking through all the other countries thinking, why is France just such an odd one out here? Because nobody else has spies yet. And I understand that it's usually a bad idea to get spies early because it slows down your civilian factory construction rate. But France has done it. Uh, it, it depends. Like in some situations, it can be more valuable than, uh, valuable than others. Within this rule set, uh, though, what I think we're most likely going to see is a lot of players going for spies in 1938. 1938 is usually when you're done building civilian factories and most nations will shift over to building military factories and they'll have more civs to spend also because of trade and, and stuff like that so what we'll most likely see is agencies being oh the italians by the way just finished the naval agency interesting or the naval department rather but all right so they did you likely find more players building spy agencies toward 1938 which is when they'll you know start using their spies to figure out what enemy army comps or naval comps are but of course, we are watching Italy here, who just uh, did a little bit of a grind on Messe, which is usually the preferred general because of his high attack stats. And he's currently doing Sadu, I think, yeah. And so Messe's... The... Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to mention the fact that Messe already has Desert Fox and Mountaineer. And what the most important trait that you're going to want to get when you're attacking general, which usually will be your um, you know, special forces or tank general, is adaptable. And the best thing is to get double adaptable, which means you have both a general and a field marshal with adaptable. And key thing here, Italy's already got Desert Fox and Mountaineer on Messe, which means that he's already got a general with adaptable, or he can click adaptable. And he's currently going for a second one. Yeah, so this Italy player has been absolutely amazing at ma managing the, the, the civil wars, especially well, the war against Ethiopia. Um, the first game that I saw, he ended the war on the hour where the deadline ended, when you have to in the rule set. It was just so clinically finished. The second game, mm -hmm. he wasn't quite as on it, but I think he did a better job of actually managing the generals uh, and getting their experience. And one thing which we have noticed is he does rotate those generals out. Very often I do see just a general and a field marshal just grinded to get them as high a level as possible. No, here he will switch them out to try and get them traded as opposed to leveled. Yeah, and somebody in uh, chat actually mentioned that Australia, or rather Canada, should be going for fighter twos, or might be, which is not the case. It's something I've seen from these players. Obviously, one key thing in vanilla multiplayer is the UK building fighter planes. Like, th that is just established. It doesn't matter what your rule set is, the UK builds fighter planes. And one thing the UK player here is doing is he just started hard researching Spitfires. And the reason he's doing that is to obviously get as far as possible. And they'll be trying to get to the fighter command focus. Th that's going to be their key here. Uh, the reason you want to get fighter command is obviously for the two times 100% fighter model uh, bonus. In the meantime, though, I, I've i noticed France is also getting fighter ones. They might be producing some planes. And Canada will, of course, be going for CAS, which means that without looking, USA is building attack bombers. And yes, they are. They are, of course, researching attacks. So, one key thing here, and this is something that I think Allied players have taken a little time to actually realize, is that there aren't any rules against the United States lent leasing France pre-fall of France. Now, this is usually a rule, but in this tournament, it is not. And a lot of players have been sleeping on the strength of bringing Cass over to France. Cass can literally put up against tanks. It, it sometimes can be insane how much damage they do. And this US player has time and again built a lot of tanks for his uh, team early game, and he is doing the same thing again. He's focusing a lot on, well, tactical bombers and a sort of other type of plane, which I'm definitely interested in finding out what they're going to do with that. Interesting. Yeah, for the most part, the uh, the rushes do seem box standard. We've got Canada using their uh, mechanized buff to get the Mech 1 research so they can... I assume they're going to be giving licenses away to their allies. Like I said, they're also rushing the Cast 2 because they've got a bonus that will give them Cast 3 faster. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, should be somewhere around here. Uh, do they? I'm actually not sure now. I thought they did, but I might be wrong there. Either way, they're going to be rushing Cast to build it. And I still don't know what the French are doing with their airplanes.